All right, welcome back to our third session of Articles of Significance. And this one, we're going to be discussing a uh, question about apical preparation, you know, short, long, at the junction, which one's better and why. And Mona, why don't you take it from here? So this is an in vitro study by Schmidt and colleagues titled, How Does Intentional Apical Foraminal Enlargement Affect the Foramen and Root Canal Morphology? Uh, in this study, 60 mesial roots of mandibular molars were scanned by micro-CT and the apical foramen was photographed before and after preparation. They were then divided into one of three groups based on working length distance from the foramen. The teeth were also placed in subgroups based on the types of foraminal enlargement with different instrumentation systems. The area, perimeter, transportation, and non-instrumented walls were evaluated and root canal transportation was assessed. The results of the study show that the apical limit of the working length affects morphologic changes in the apical anatomy of teeth and that instrumentation at or beyond the constriction promoted foraminal enlargement and transportation. The results also showed that foraminal enlargement did not facilitate instrument interaction with the canal walls, suggesting that working length should be limited to the apical constriction or shorter to avoid alterations in the apical anatomy that could affect the outcome. So it sounds like the apical limit of instrumentation is one of the more controversial aspects of canal debridement. <laughs> Are there any situations that you think instrumenting beyond the apical foramen is appropriate? And do the results of this study change your clinical practice? I think what the authors bring up in the introduction that there are risks in over-instrumentation of you know, introducing pathogens, irritants, irrigant solutions um, into that space, it means that clinically it's something I'm trying to avoid. Being an in vitro study, first of all, they're not finding you know, real clear benefits. They're finding that if we are even just maintaining patency, you know, sort of causing some transportation, um, whether that's clinically relevant or not, still you know, sort of is in question. So it's not something we aim to do, um, you know, really as clinicians, because there's limited data to show a real benefit. To the author's points in their introduction that instrumenting beyond the apex it should be considered because especially in pulpless teeth we're dealing, uh, dealing with bacteria within that opening and the thought was that instrumentation beyond the apex could clean that opening mechanically you know what they showed in their results was that it left a good portion of that apical constriction untouched with mechanical instrumentation, which is similar to research by Peters and others that show that you know canal walls are left untouched during instrumentation, even with rotary instruments. And so we're not demonstrating a clear benefit um, of cleaning that apical constriction. Um, in fact, we're not cleaning the entirety of that constriction. So um, this wouldn't change my clinical approach to care. What about you? In the argument over patency or no patency, and actually we had that at the, was at the two AAEs ago, debate between Dr. Ricucci and Dr. Buchanan on the topic. I think it dates back, it's not really, uh, it dates back to Dr. Schilder, who kind of had this idea of patency, which was based on the idea that you have to filter the RT, you have to instrument to the RT, and then have this continuous taper, which means, you know, you're going to end up with patency whether you want it or not. So it's a byproduct of that form of instrumentation. I feel like it was originally designed to address a problem, and that was the problem of lack of knowledge of where the apical constriction is. To me, the problem, that problem has been solved with apex locators. But the but the, the the habit kind of persists. Now turned into this kind of visualization of how you're going to address that last you know uh, millimeter of, of potential tissue. To me, clinically, first of all, there should be a distinction between vital cases and non-vital cases because there's zero argument that I can accept that would be valuable for use of the patency technique in a vital case, other than you just don't like your patient. <laughs> right? You just want to create some post-op pain, you know. <laughs> but uh, other than that, it's not. You could make a valid argument potentially for non-vital cases, but then again, I think that that is addressed through the use of apex locators. There's, you know, that wasn't before. You kind of, well, well did I really clean that last millimeter? Or does it, is it, you know, is it, is it out? Whatever. So that's why they need to tap the puff to confirm that. But all of that, as far as I'm concerned, is off the table since apex locators. You could make the argument that there could potentially be some debris from instrumentation that could be packed. But as far as I'm concerned, again, 
if you do proper instrumentation, which means that you're managing debris throughout your chemomechanical instrumentation, there's no reason for you to be packing debris. Now, if you're using you know, any of these, I know they talk about a difference between reciprocation and rotation, but there's no question that if you're going to use reciprocation, then the question is how you're going to use it. If you stay in the canal too long, just because it's reciprocation and it's safer, you're just going to generate a lot of debris and that debris is going to get packed. So in those kinds of cases, I'm not sure if patency would help, but still, you know, managing that debris would be helpful. Plus, let's not forget that this was just a non-clinical uh, study. So the role of post-op pain is not addressed here in this thing. We just know, you know, how things are. So for me personally, I've never tried to have patency as a goal. Have I ended up with patency here and there? Yeah, because, you know, none of us are, you know, a quarter millimeter accurate in our hand instrumentation. So it is going to have some things. When it has happened, then I'm, I've used the patency technique. And when it doesn't happen, I didn't use the patency yeah. technique. So it was always intentional. <laughs> so, but, but so that's the key thing is to just, uh, I think, be aware of the factors. And I think uh, I agree completely with Brooke and Brooke that it's not necessarily something that we want to use. But it's interesting too. I mean, what do you guys think about the fact that, you know, a patency only addresses one main exit, but we all know there's all kinds of exits down there, right? So how does that seem like it's, you know, is that like favoring one than the, than the others? I mean, it is favoring one as opposed to the others, but what I thought was interesting and maybe you guys did as well, was that even with a patency file here, there was still transportation of the yeah. apex. And, you know, is that clinically relevant? We don't really know, uh, but I, I, didn't necessarily expect to find that reading this paper um, and the fact that it's present for all of them, mm -hmm. even with the 10 file. Yeah. Do we need to be more careful? So we don't know if it's clinically relevant. Exactly. <laughs> Still been a very heavy handed operator with a 10 file. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what they did here in this case is they use a 2506, both in rotation uh, with a file system I'm not familiar with, and then as well as reciprocation with reciproc, which I am uh, familiar with. So the 2506 shape, where do you guys stand in terms of the um, taper and the instrumentation? And where do you guys stand in terms of this minimally invasive movement? And where, what is enough? Is what I always talk about. It's like, we all know that, you know, you can kill a, you know, you can kill a fly with a, uh, you know, with a fly sweater or with a shotgun. <laughs> the question here is what is enough? I mean, I think our focus is cleaning the anatomy. And we know that instrumentation is only one part of that. The idea of irrigation being a huge part of what we do. Um, Rebecca mentioned the Peters study. We're touching about, you know, 60 something percent of the walls of a tooth. You know, the study shows we still, even with the patency, even with blowing out the apex, we are um, leaving non-instrumented walls. You know, we kind of want to meet in the middle. We don't want to overly enlarge teeth. At the same time, we do want to get all the tissue out of the chamber. So we're probably meeting in the middle there somewhere, um, but not taking any one extreme. All of this points to the necessity for good irrigation, active irrigation. You know, there's clear evidence that that does improve dis uh, debridement and dis and disinfection. We're using 04 tapered instruments. So just for those of you that are curious, um, we're using 04 tapered instruments, but making sure apical preparations are large enough to remove the tissue that's present and considering the anatomy that's there from the beginning um, and enlarging things to a degree where we're confident that tissue has been removed, uh, but we're also not going to over instrument a space and we're going to utilize active irrigants to remove the rest of the debris that's present. No, I think that that is a key thing is the understanding that, you know, taper and apical diameter are two separate things. You know, if you have larger tapers, you're going to end up coronally removing a lot of dentin, where I think it's not quite the priority because ultrasonics and irrigation clean up that space pretty well. The challenge is always in the apical diameter. And going with these smaller apical diameters that you see nowadays with people using like a size 17, you know that file is floating in there. It's not touching the walls, you know, 1704, and it's always kind of associated with, well, then if you buy this piece of technology, it'll, <laughs> it'll work. To me, if you go with a larger, better gauged apical diameter, that's probably the most efficient way of scraping the walls and cleaning it up for a lot cheaper than some of the expensive alternatives. But I think some of that stuff gets um, shopped to the side when people are always more enthusiastic to buy new things. And so they end up thinking more in terms of technology. But the, the key here is that I feel like the more minimally invasive you are, then you tend to have to use more irrigation and even do things in multiple visits. And right? you can't have your cake and eat it too. Right, absolutely. Right? 
because the limiting factor is the biofilm. What do you do in your office? Do you do mostly single, multiple visits, or what, what are your goals? I think it's really case specific. So for cases that present with significant clinical signs of infection, so swelling, sinus tracts, pretty much two visit therapy, sometimes even a third visit, depending on how healing's going. Um, and using you intracanal. The, uh, uh, the we, sinus tract healing before it, you fill. Yes, yes. Um, and we're using calcium hydroxide as our first line medicament and giving it plenty of time to allow for healing because sinus tracts might take more than a week to fully resolve. Um, so we're doing a fair amount still of two visit therapy. That said, we're not afraid of doing single visit endodontics, even on necrotic teeth, as long as we do a thorough clean out. So, you know, our office is not a 45 minute root canal, um, we wanna make sure that the irrigant solutions have enough contact time with tissues. And so, you know, sometimes that sitting on, you know, and using an endo activator kind of thing after we finished our mechanical debridement for a little extra time uh, to make sure that we're getting, you know, adequate contact time of the sodium hypochlorite with the tissues for, for full debridement, especially in a single visit case. And, and what about you in your clinical practice? What are you gravitating toward or is it a mix? Like what I we're describing? I have done, to be honest, single visit endo since I, I did a table clinic when I was a pre-doc student in dental school. Like, I don't want to date myself, but more like 30, more than 30 years ago. And that was going to look into the literature, see in terms of the merits of a single visit versus multiple visit. And it was going to like single visit works. I always say uh, it's not the number of visits, it's achieving the objective. So if you have proper systems and adequate efficiency in terms of finding all the canals, getting down to all the canals, cleaning them to an adequate apical diameter and run enough volume of uh, hypochlorite down there that it could have a good chance of uh, addressing the infection, you know, finish it in one visit. If you don't, then take as long as it takes until you can achieve those objectives. I think that the factor, the mistake that we make is we set it as the number of visits as opposed to the objectives. Kind of reminds me of files. People say, how many times should I use a file? I'm like, well, it's not the number of times, it's how much work you're getting out of the file. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. I mean, it's not equal yeah. if you're doing a central incisor or you're doing a four canal molar. Right. So, all right, so this one's done too. Join us for the final uh, segment for the Articles of Significance.